Okay, let's start. Hello and welcome all. My name is Marie-Claude Côté from Canada. I'm currently on personal leave from Library and Archives Canada. It's my pleasure to moderate the first session of invited talk of DCMI 2021, 2021 virtual conference. The theme is, I believe, O Canada as both our invited speakers live and work in Canada, as well as the moderator. Um, I know, I know, and I know of so many excellent metadata initiatives, practices, practitioners, thinkers in Canada from one coast to another, that when I suggested these two invited talk, my idea was to showcase two of them, uh, two of the best, of the excellent, uh, you imagine how good they are. And uh, I wanted to uh, also, um, I hope they will inspire you to persevere in uh, your metadata projects. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the land on which I am at the moment is uh, part of a traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people as I am in the Ottawa region. Okay, so our first speaker, let me share my, uh, my screen before I go continue. Okay, so our first speaker will be Emma Griffiths, research associate at the Faculty of Health Science at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Her presentation is entitled Putting, Putting Standards into Practice, Pathogen Genomics, Contextual Data, Metadata, uh, Standards in Public Health and Food Safety. For the anecdote, uh, that's funny because on Monday, I moderated a panel on metadata and privacy in which the first uh, presentation was entitled, Metadata Can Kill. Well, today, metadata can save lives. Uh, our second speaker will be John Roberts. Let me change this slide. John Roberts from the Government of Ontario in Toronto. John is the Chief Privacy Officer, the Archivist of Ontario, and the Acting Chief Information Security Officer for the Government of Ontario. So yes, you get a three for one. That's a very good deal. And uh, John plays these three roles for the Government of Ontario from the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. He will present um, a presentation called Meta Data Enabled Government. Though they come from uh, different domains, you will notice that they have lots in common in terms of metadata needs, metadata challenges, and also metadata benefits. I invite you to consult the conference website for full details about our speakers. So here's how I will conduct the session. Emma will present for about 40 minutes or so, uh, and we'll take a few questions right after for five, 10 minutes. Then John will present, also for 40-ish minutes, and we'll take another uh, five, 10 minutes for questions. And then we will finish the session with the question and answer uh, period to continue the discussion with our invited speakers. I encourage you to send your questions as they come using the chat function in Zoom. There are two options for sending your questions to all participants or to host and speakers. Please choose to all participants if you have technical issues you need assistance with, send a message to host and speakers. But for your question, chat, all participants, and I will read them on your behalf. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome Emma Griffith. Emma, you have the control of the screen. Wonderful, okay, thank you, MC. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Oh, we didn't right. say I didn't launch my um, my thing. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for the introduction, MC. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Marie Claude and all of the other organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work 
uh, that we're doing in developing data standards and ontologies for path uh, pathogen genomics contextual data, as well as the associated tools that are critical for putting these standards into practice in public health and food safety settings. And before I begin, I would just like to take a minute to um, acknowledge that I'll be presenting today on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and tsleil tooth nations. And uh, I'd just like to uh, take a moment to uh, ask all of the participants in the, the session today to reflect on the history of the lands that they're from and the lands that they occupy. Okay, so uh, in the next 40-ish minutes or so, I'll give you a quick overview of the genomic surveillance contextual data and the challenges, so I'll give you a quick overview of what that is, what genomic surveillance contextual data is, and the challenges that are associated with sharing and integrating that data. I'll describe some of the data standards, ontologies, and tools that are being used as solutions to some of those challenges. I'll highlight the COVID-19 response as an example of how those tools have been put into practice, and then we'll wrap up and I'll leave you with some links to the resources that I mentioned in the talk. So, as you probably all know, all living things contain genetic material that acts as the blueprints for life. So that genetic material instructs a cell on how to act, it controls what the cell looks like, how it should function, and how it should reproduce. Now, organisms that make us sick are called pathogens. And the genetic material from pathogens can be extracted and sequenced, and those sequences can be analyzed using bioinformatics tools and technique techniques. Because these genomic sequences are unique and because they change as pathogens reproduce and spread over time, they act like molecular fingerprints that can be used to identify the sources of contamination and infection. And knowing this, public health labs and food safety agencies can exchange these sequences to track and control infectious diseases. So when we talk about pathogen genomics data, we're of course talking about the sequence data but we're also talking about something called contextual data. And when I say that, I mean the sample metadata, the associated lab testing data, the epidemiological information, as well as the methods information and the quality control thresholds that, get, that enable us to interpret the sequence data and that give us confidence in those interpretations. So in other words, the metadata, but we try not to call it metadata because all of these things are actually data to other scientists and epidemiologists get really angry with us because they think it makes it sound like that data is less important than the sequence data. And it's not, it's, it's very important, it's critical even. And we can do lots of things with that contextual data like characterize lineages, sequence types and clusters. We can identify variants with clinical significance. We can correlate genomics trends with outcomes and risk factors. We can also compare results between different laboratories, and we can generate hypotheses about the sources of contamination or infection, which we can test. And all of that ultimately informs decision-making for public health responses and enables us to monitor the success of different interventions. Now, the sharing and use of genomics data on its own is generally pretty straightforward and not that controversial. There are data standards and formats that are widely used and uh, widely and routinely used for sequence data. However, those files tend to be pretty large. There are also a number of challenges and barriers to sharing and using contextual data that accompanies the sequence data. Those challenges include the lack of a mechanism for data sharing between partners, which can include both technical platforms, but also data governance frameworks. There's also security and privacy considerations. Who maintains control over the data is also a big issue when it comes to things like attribution or intellectual property or the political consequences of the spread of infectious disease. So controlling data under those conditions is important. There are issues of semantic interoperability, so when words mean different things to different people and also to different computers. And the data also requires a lot of manual curation before it's analysis ready. 
So to better position Canadian public health labs to analyze and share pathogen sequence and contextual data, the Public Health Agency of Canada, in collaboration with our teams at the BC Centre for Disease Control and Simon Fraser University, have developed the Integrated Rapid Infectious Disease Analysis Platform, otherwise known as ERIDA. So ERIDA is a distributed platform for analysis and data management, and it enables users to manage projects and samples via a really intuitive, easy to use graphical interface. Um, the platform's architecture enables reproducible and version controlled analytical modules to be built in as needed, customized to user needs. Uh, and the platform, the platform also provides tools for moving data around. So, for example, automated uploaders for sequencers and also exporters that can move data to public repositories. So, ERIDA's decentralized architecture enables users with different installations at different institutions to selectively share data simply by changing permissions within the system. So, for example, a few years ago, we performed an exercise where we shared data between the BC CDC in Vancouver with the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, and then also with a collaborator at a hospital in Geneva, and we did this in a round robin, and we did it in real time. So currently, you can give users access rights to entire projects within the system. But in the near future, we're hoping to build in finer grain access controls that enable users to release only certain sequences and only certain fields of information. And the ability to be selective in sharing is incredibly important because often you only need particular pieces of information in order to detect trends that a health that, that can alert health authorities and agencies that an event is occurring so that action can be taken. So for example, if a food or agricultural agency is monitoring the food supply and they detect a greater than baseline occurrence of a pathogen in a particular commodity, and then a public health agency detects the same trend in people consuming that commodity, action can be taken without compromising patient privacy or damaging the reputation of companies, which is important if you want them to voluntarily participate in investigations and spend money um, in costly recalls or shutdowns or other, uh, other pauses in production. Now, one of the biggest challenges in combining data from different agencies and different sources is the variety of data structures used to encode information. Different organizations use different fields to capture different types of information. And this is an issue because some groups use the same words to mean different things and they can use different words to mean the same things. So for example, in the slide here, you can see a list of fields from real Canadian surveillance data. So if you were to look at the words, the phrases in, in the top bracket you, you see in the slide here, you would know that if you were to look at the values that are populating those fields, you would know that uh, those are just different ways to specify the sample type. Whereas when the lab that um, in the, the, the lower bracket uses the word source, which looks just like the, the word source in the top bracket, if you were to look at the values that are populating that field, you'd see that what the, that lab is actually talking about is the submitting lab or the source of the sequence data. So a person looking at the data can understand those differences and similarities, but a computer can't unless you tell it how. So you can't just combine fields of information together without a significant amount of human intervention first. Another challenge when combining data from different sources is that the values that go into the fields are often encoded using free text. And so the data contains errors, abbreviations, shorthand, domain specific jargon, different formats are used, people provide different levels of granularity in the information that they provide, and the information is often inconsistently collected. So some fields can be populated by some groups some of the time and not so much others. And so all of this data needs to be cleaned and harmonized before it can be integrated for analyses. And that can take hours, it can take days, it can take longer than that. And this all ultimately affects your time to response. So let's just take a minute to summarize all of that. So what we've been talking about is that the variability in data structures between projects, between labs and databases is due to the different ways that we encode information. So uh, people use different fields, they use different terms, and those fields and terms have different meanings. 
Uh, people provide different levels of granularity of information, and they provide different information types. And that variability all impacts how you can use and interpret the data. But luckily, there are genomics contextual data standards that can be used to improve harmonization and integration. So one of the primary resources for genomics contextual data standardization are minimum information checklists, and those are developed by the Genomic Standards Consortium. These are lists of prescribed uh, fields, and those specifications come with field labels, uh, with definitions, with data types and syntax specifications, and examples of use for core attributes that are common to different kinds of sequences. So you have those prescribed lists that are common if you're describing genomes or metagenomes or molecular sequence markers. There are also uh, specific attribute packages for different kinds of natural built or anatomical environments. And all of these different packages are often implemented by international sequence repositories. Now, another way of structuring information that many of you may be familiar with uh, is through the use of ontologies. So ontologies contain controlled vocabulary that are structured in a hierarchy, and the terms are connected to each other using logical relationships. Now, these relationships can link information in a lot of different types of ways. The simplest is shown in one of my possibly all-time favorite beer ont uh, ontologies, which is this hypothetical beer ontology, where you can see different types of logical relationships link uh, a logger to uh, a type of, they link a, a logger um, to a, cat a class of category of light beer, um, and they use the is a relationship. So a logger is a light beer, and then a light beer is a type of beer. But other relationships can be used to link uh, types of beer to ingredients, to methods of production, to characteristics and qualities, and a lot more things. Now, one of the most important things about ontologies is that every term is assigned a unique identifier, and every term distinguished by an identifier gets its own definition. And that's important because, as we've already seen, sometimes the same words have different meanings in different contexts. Ontologies also incorporate synonyms, and these synonyms can help facilitate mapping between different data dictionaries across organizations and agencies when those ontology terms are used as values for the fields in minimum information checklists. So ontologies can be very powerful things for harmonization and for building interoperability. Now, how you build an ontology or its architecture can affect how you use it. So you can make an ontology for, for a project in whatever way that you feel is useful for you in your work. Um, and there has been a proliferation of ontologies that were built for specific purposes. But when ontologies are built in a vacuum, it limits their interoperability, which means it limits the interoperability of the data that they, um, that has been used, has been annotated using those different ontologies. The OBO Foundry, or otherwise known as the Open Biological and uh, Biomedical Ontology Foundry, is a community of scientists that develop ontologies using a set of principles and practices designed to fil facilitate consensus and interoperability. And basically, they use two core ontologies that prescribe how things, how things should be grouped into classes. And then there's another one that prescribes the relations that should be used to link those different classes. So put together, basically these foundational ontologies act like building blocks that, in, that enable domain experts to build sets of interoperable ontologies. And one of the key principles of the Obo Foundry is this concept of the reuse of terms across different domains. Um, so that a word always means the same thing across different domains and it's denoted using the same ID. So if you're developing an ontology and there's already a term that exists that you want, uh, you just need to use that term from an existing ontology instead of creating a new one. And this helps create consistent consistency, but also linkages between domains of knowledge. And the Opal Foundry also provides some oversight. So you need to apply to have your ontology to become part of the, to become part of the Foundry library. And there's some centralization of identifier assignment um, and tracking. So that helps to prevent ID clash between ontologies. 
And all of the ontologies in the library are open source and free to use. So uh, I say that there's over 150 in the slide here, um, but there's actually a lot more than that. This is a little outdated. There's probably over 200 different ontologies in the Obo Foundry Library, and many of those are useful for annotating public health and food safety data. Um, from ontologies describing geography and taxonomy and anatomy to disease phenotypes and environments and food and much more. So Data standards for pathogen genomics serve many functions. As we've discussed, they one, help make data more usable and understandable for humans and computers. Two, they help to capture information in a way so that you can use it for different projects and applications in the future. Three, they help to create interoperability between labs and databases. And four, because they make data more consistent and interoperable, Standards also help uh, make it easier to build tools to work with the data. So we've so far described generic standards and ontology so far, but now I'd like to tell you about some specific examples. So an example of a useful ontology for food data for food safety is called the food ontology, otherwise known as Foodon, and this is developed by our lab. And Foodon has over 28,000 terms for describing food products, animal feed, as well as food sources, characteristics, and processes, and a lot more. It uses a facet-based scheme for organizing information about a lot of different things, from taxonomy to anatomical parts of organisms to how food is cooked, preserved, processed, and a lot more. It also encompasses a number of existing food dictionaries. So in fact, we're in the process of mapping food on terms to the European Food Safety Agency's Food X2 food product list. And because of its utility, food on is being used by a number of different initiatives and other ontologies actually, not just for food safety, but for nutrition, for recipe and food ingredient databases, for food allergy work, uh, for food biomarkers and metabolites, and even drug interactions. Now, to manage all of these different interests from all of these different organizations and initiatives, we have two different consortia associated with the ontology. One that consists of curators who do the hard work of actually building and updating the resource. And we have a second broader consortium known as the Joint Food Ontology Workgroup, which is an informal group composed of a range of subject matter experts from different organizations all around the world, and we're always looking for new members. We've also developed another ontology that contains useful vocabulary for describing non-food related information about samples, their contexts, instruments, and analyses. Uh, like different natural and built in environments, different an anatomical parts of humans or animals, um, assays, methods and devices, and different kinds of information entities to describe provenance, data provenance. So like who collected the sample, when they collected it, uh, their contact information and so on. Um, and also uh, methods information for genomics investigations. Uh, the ontology is called the Genomic Epidemiology Ontology, or GenEpio, and it aims to provide vocabulary for integrating genomics, lab, clinical, epi, uh, epidemiological data, all of which is critical for whole genome sequencing-based microbial pathogen investigations. So, Foodon and GenEpio have been used for standardize, standardizing information in a surveillance uh, platform called Genome Tracker. So Genome Tracker is a foodborne surveillance tracking network, and that takes in data from labs all around the world. The idea is if you're monitoring the presence of pathogens in different environments routinely, if you can make matches in, a, in one database, uh, you can link sources of contamination and illness to supply chains faster. And once you make those linkages, you can take action faster and prevent a lot of cases of illness. So we'd like to kind of describe this as a sort of like a, a Tinder for making matches between different foodborne pathogen sequences from labs all over the world with the goal of it acting as an early warning system. Um, and the network is brokered by the FDA and the database is housed at the National Center for My, uh, Biotechnology Information or NCBI. This is a public repository. And the database can, contains over 630,000 sequences and associated metadata 
uh, for different kinds of foodborne pathogens. And the metadata or contextual data is provided by the submitting labs and the source sample descriptions are almost exclusively free text. So those descriptions can get pretty mess messy pretty quickly. Uh, now to be able to understand foodborne pathogens, uh, we have to record information about the samples that we test and where we're looking for those bacteria and viruses. And descriptions of food and the environments from, uh, from where it comes from can vary greatly depending on who's doing the describing, there are culture or conventions, and what the information is being used for. So for example, there are different meanings of the word biscuit depending on who you're talking to, uh, and there's also a lot of different ways to describe chickpeas. Now, there are tools that can help you find standardized terms for sample descriptions. There are these things called ontology lookup services. For example, the one that you can see in the slide here, which is one of our favorites, it's the UK's EBI OLS. Um, and that enables you to enter a word or a short phrase into the search bar and, and uh, it'll perform a search for you uh, through all of the available ontologies that it has built into its database. Um, and it'll, it'll uh, find the closest match for you. And this is very useful. Uh, the trick is though, that it's a very manual process. So if you have to standardize a lot of terms, say 630,000 of them for a genomic surveillance network, doing it manually becomes a little unfeasible. So in that case where standardization needs to be performed in bulk, we, our lab has developed a tool to help automate the mapping of free text descriptions to standardized ontology terms to better enable the interpretation of genomic matches. And the tool is called LexMapper. And in addition to standardizing terms, it takes the standardization one step further in that it classifies those standardized terms according to different third party schemes. So for example, in the slide that you see here, we have uh, a third party classification scheme called IFSAC plus, and that's a classification scheme used by the US FDA, USDA and CDC for describing foods associated with outbreaks. So LexMapper is open source. You can install your own instance of it on your own machine so that you can perform your own data transformations um, locally and you can protect privacy and confidentiality. Uh, we offer also offer LexMapper as an online service and you can see that in the slide here. Uh, it's really easy. You just have to upload a TSV into the platform um, that contains your sample IDs and a column of the sample descriptions that you want to standardize. And LexMapper will report back the cleaned up terms, the mapped ontology terms, and also right now the, the higher level IFSAC terms. Now, LexMapper also has the ability for other classification schemes to be built in. You just have to tell us what you want. Um, and also you can process thousands of records in, in, some, in just minutes. Okay, so here in the slide here, uh, you can see an example of the annotations um, in the genome tracker biosamples. So these are the metadata records in the surveillance system. Um, and you can see here the annotations provided by LexMapper as well as our, on, our ontologies in the red box. And the standardized contextual data tags are available to all the users in the network and that helps to improve their querying in the system. And uh, Genome Tracker is implementing these tools, these metadata tools as part of its uh, data curation system. Okay, so in addition to the Genomic Standards Consortium and their minimum information checklists, which we've already discussed, uh, there are other authoritative sources <coughs> that develop standards, uh, such as the International Organization for Standards, who they might have probably heard of, also known as ISO. And ISO standards are really beneficial because they're developed via international consensus, and they provide criteria and guidance for ensuring consistency and quality. So right now, ISO is in the process of developing a standard for the use of whole genome sequencing for the genomic characterization of food bacteria. Uh, and, our, and, and I'm involved in that effort. And the standard is, is right now in the final stages of international review. It actually just went out for its final vote last week. Uh, and it contains guidance not only for sequencing and the bioinformatics processing of data, but as well as recommendations for capturing and structuring contextual data. So the metadata module provides a list of fields for capturing information to describe the sample, 
the isolate as well as the sequence and recommended ontology terms for populating those fields in the standard have been packaged together in what's known as an ontology slim and that can be found at our github site and the slim uh, while you have to pay for iso standards the slim so that's got the fields and the terms for the metadata um, harmonization uh, is open and freely available for use so the draft ISO standard and the ontology SLIM are actually being put into practice right now in a Canadian genomics research and development initiative examining the presence and evolution of antimicrobial resistance genes and resistant bacteria in the Canadian food supply that ultimately impact human health. So you probably have heard about this already. Antimicrobial resistance, it's also known as AMR, this is a massive problem around the world, and it's caused by pathogens evolving ways to reduce their susceptibility to antibiotics in antimicrobial agents. And this is not good because, as you know, antibiotics and antimicrobials are our last line of defense against a lot of different life-threatening infections. So genomics is increasingly being used to routinely identify and monitor the presence of resistance genes and bacteria in different settings. So this particular initiative is an interagency effort. So it's combining the efforts of the Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as other agricultural, regulatory, and environmental agencies that all aim to integrate their all of their testing data to better understand hotspots and trends. And again, we run into the same issues of when we're combining data from different sources, they have different fields, they have different terms, there's different granularity, and and the words and fields have different meanings. So here is some examples of how we're putting the standards into practice. So here you can see some examples of free text descriptions of samples representing mock, food, animal clinical, and environmental samples. So the ISO standard is providing the standardized fields, and the food on and the food on and genepio ontologies are providing the standardized terms. And the harmonized data can be much more easily integrated for analyses. Um, and it's also better suited for doing more complex um, processes like machine learning and, and inferencing. And once it's standardized, the data can be more easily fed into different downstream tools as well. Now, of course, public health and food safety geno genomics contextual data needs to be handled carefully. So when you're working with genomics data, it's generally de-identified first. So you're not working with names or addresses or health identifiers. But it all it when you're working with this data it and you're planning to share it, it depends on um, identifiability depends on the number of cases that there are in a certain geographical area on a certain day. Uh, because different kind combinations of different pieces of information that you have um, could possibly become re-identifiable. So it's not just names and addresses that are identifiable. It, once you have unique combinations of information, that can make that information re-identifiable. Now, unfortunately, there's no magic algorithm where you can plug in the pieces of information that you have and have the, the tool spit out some measurement of risk. And because of that, agencies have to work with privacy officers to work through risk assessments, um, which, and then the result of that is people tend to be on, the, tend to be risk averse. And so it's a bit of a double edged sword um, because protecting patient privacy is incredibly important uh, for maintaining public trust. If you don't protect, or if you don't have, if people don't trust your agency, they're not going to follow guidelines or restrictions. Um, they're not going to get tested. Uh, they won't seek treatment. And so this has public trust has a direct and immediate consequence for people's health. The flip side is that if you're not sharing data and you're not being forthcoming with information, then the public might not think that you're being transparent with your activities. And so that might impact public trust as well. So data stewardship can be a bit of a tightrope walking exercise. Also, as part of data stewardship, it's very important to track where the data is coming from. So it's provenance, chain of custody, and so on. Um, it's also important to track how it's processed. So keeping track of the wet lab and bioinformatics methods, uh, which all can affect the final analysis. 
And you need to capture and record this information in a way so that it's reproducible and so that it's auditable. Because this information can become a matter of legal record if you have to go to court about something and the genomics work was used as evidence for a decision or an action that was taken. So contextual data sometimes needs to have a higher level of security than just the sequence data uh, alone. And sometimes you can end up having to use different databases uh, to contain those two different types of information. And if errors are detected, it's important to correct them. Um, but this can be complicated sometimes because the errors can propagate out to different places if you're sharing data with other agencies or public repositories. And there's probably been fewer arguments for data standards and careful data, data stewardship more pronounced than during the COVID-19 pandemic. So genomic sequencing has really been one of the heroes of the pandemic. It's provided data that's that has been critical for the development of diagnostic tests and vaccines, for tracking transmission and outbreaks locally and globally. Uh, it's been critical for identifying variants of concern and for ending, understanding viral origins and also viral evolution. In Canada, our genomic surveillance program is part of a larger initiative called CANCOGEN, or the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network. And this initiative aims to do a number of things, such as track and control outbreaks and transmission, uh, but also generate data for research purposes. Uh, we have the goal of sequencing 150,000 viral genomes, which we've already accomplished, as well as 10,000 matched human genomes. So we're matching the host and the pathogen genomics data to be able to understand uh, the genetic contributions of both the host and the pathogen to outcomes and risks. Um, and in Canada, we have a decentralized health system. Uh, so health is under the jurisdiction of our 10 provinces and three territories. So that's 13 different health authorities that are generating data in this initiative. And that all needs to be coordinated by our federal health authority, which is the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, specifically our uh, National Microbiology Lab, that's our national reference lab. Um, and th that coordination needs to happen so that we can understand how COVID is getting into Canada and how it's moving around. So we've already discussed how data needs to be shared and how in a health crisis, you need to get the right types of information to the right people and you need to do this quickly. And different types of information can be generated by teams within an organization. So for example, you could have data being generated in a clinic, it could be being generated in a testing lab, it can be being generated by epidemiologists in the epi group. And so all of that data may need to be shared within an organization, but it might also need to be shared with trusted partners outside of that organization, uh, like labs in a network, say. Um, but it might also need to be shared with a public repository or an international organization like the WHO to fulfill your, your uh, national reporting obligations. So you need to be able to triage what bits of data need to go where, and you need to be able to combine that data as needed, and you need to be able to do this across a variety of data management systems. So this is how we're doing it in Cancogen. So our lab is the metadata harmonization team, and we've developed a data standard and a tool to help labs structure their, their contextual data according to the standard. And these resources have been deployed to all of the different health authorities who are submitting data to the national database. And the sequence data is shared and stored using the ARIDA platform that we've already discussed. Um, and once the data is shared with the NML, it can be used for A, different kinds of national analyses, or B, it can, it can be submitted to different public repositories, um, and C, it can be reported to our chief health officer, and D, it can also be shared with the WHO. So the data standard covers a lot of different areas of information. So from information about infected individuals, like their age and gender, to their vaccination status, uh, to where the data is coming from. There are over 100 fields in the data standard, but not all of them are being used uh, routinely. So only a subset of these were prioritized for genomic surveillance, and the rest are all there to structure information on a more ad hoc basis. 
Uh, the fields have been sourced where possible from existing standards, and all of the terms are have been mapped uh, to other standards and in, on, ontologies uh, to help create interoperability between databases and systems. So to get all the provincial and territorial labs submitting harmonized data to the National Microbiology Lab, we've developed a tool called the Data Harmonizer. And this is essentially a spreadsheet style text editing application uh, that has all of the standardized fields. It's got drop down menus of standardized terms. It's got widgets for standardizing formats like dates. Uh, the fields routinely collected for surveillance are color coded in yellow and they're considered required. And you can see those in the slide here. Um, all of the other fields you can't really see here because the view that I've got here is just the required set. Um, there are also other fields that are colored purple and those are recommended um, as opposed to being required. And there are other fields that are white and those are just optional. Um, if you double click on any of the field headers in the tool, it'll pop up uh, a little box that, pro that provides the definition of that field, as well as guidance for filling it in and examples. Um, and you can save the data as you're entering it. So if you have to stop and go and do something, you can save it and then you can open again later. Um, you can auto populate fields to reduce repetitive entry. You can jump around to different fields. There's a number of different usability features that we've tried to incorporate based uh, largely on user requests. Um, and once the data is entered, you can also validate everything to make sure it's all present and correct. And any errors or missing information is flagged to the user. So as we've discussed, um, genomics data is very useful for, for different things. And so it needs to be shared with different downstream organizations or databases or systems. And as we also know, different repositories and databases use different fields to capture and store information. And there's, there's not a lot we can do about that. Um, and so very often the data has to be reformatted before it can be shared with different downstream destinations. So one of the most important features of the data harmonizer is that it'll enable the automated reformatting of data for different endpoints. So you can enter the data once and then you just click a button and it'll reformat it for pretty much anywhere that you want it to go. And this saves a lot of time and energy, um, but also at the same time, it provides standardized values within those different fields. And that helps to clean up databases wherever that uh, that cleaned up information ends up going. So there are a lot of national sequencing efforts that are going on all around the world, and everyone is needing to deal with these metadata challenges um, as, as the same challenges that I've just described to you. Now, to address these challenges internationally, there's an organization called the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, and this otherwise known as PHAGE. And Phage is coming at these problems from a number of different perspectives, um, and they're handling them through uh, a number of different work groups that you can see listed on the slide there. So I lead the data structures work group, and this group is focused on developing and promoting the implementa implementation of data standards in public health settings with the goal of improved public health response and surveillance. So our work group was able to take the Cancogen data standard and internationalize it. Um, and, you know, the, the world's public health agencies <clears throat> pretty much run on spreadsheets. <laughs> so um, as unglorious as that is. Um, so the data standard has also been implemented as an Excel collection template, um, as well as a machine readable JSON structure, which is available for application development. So the collection template comes with a field level reference guide, um, as well as a curation SOP, which includes guidance regarding different privacy, ethical, and practical considerations when it comes to data sharing, because some of the labs that will be implementing this are just getting into genomic sequencing because of COVID. Um, and so the, the, this, this sort of advice is very helpful. Now, labs may also not be familiar with sub submission procedures uh, for different public repositories. And so we've developed a number of different protocols for how to submit data to different repositories to lower the barrier to mobilizing this information. And um, we've also made some little instructional videos to help share experience and expertise. And we hope that, you know, these little, uh, little videos and, and tips help make processes a little bit easier. 
So the data standard has been picked up by other labs and initiatives around the world, including the US, uh, networks in South America, in Africa, uh, in Australia, uh, and the number of Im implementers continues to grow. And uh, we've already had to do actually one major update to, to the standard to reflect all of the requests and feedback that we've received. And having developers being responsive to user needs is a big key to its usability. Uh, the more that it's tested out in the field, the more fit for purpose it becomes. And also data as well as data standards have to evolve over time. So for, at, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have variants of concern, we didn't have cases of reinfection. And so we didn't have the data structures to capture this information. Um, but as the pandemic continues to evolve, we've had to ad adapt the standard. And um, at, as it continues to evolve in the future, we anticipate that we will, we will have to do further updates. Also, having international input has been key to shining uh, a light on some of our blind spots. So for example, when we were working with scientists in a lab from the Gambia in Africa to deploy the standard, they told us that we needed to add fields that were able to capture information about samples captured under non-ideal conditions. So in places where freezers might not immediately be handy. And that was something that we hadn't considered because to be honest with you, most of the members of our group are from high income countries or they're from labs that are very well kitted out. So internationalizing a standard isn't just telling a lot of people to use it. You really need that input from people practicing in different settings under different conditions. So contextual data and data standards uh, often get a bad rap because data, man data management is not the sexy part of genomics, um, but they're absolutely fundamental to making the enterprise work. And so incorporating them um, often and early in a surveillance program or a se sequencing initiative is important and people are just not always aware of that. And so communicating about standards is part of putting them into practice. And so our phage team has discussed the SARS-CoV-2 data spec on a popular bioinformatics podcast called the Microbinfi podcast. So if you're, you know, doing the dishes, the laundry or something, and you'd like to have something to listen to on in the background, um, I invite you to have a listen. So that was a lot of information all at once. Um, but I think I would sum things up by saying that data standards, the tools and resources to implement them, and the users of the standards and the tools um, that, that are putting these things into practice uh, to provide the domain knowledge and the feedback uh, that, that goes into the development cycle. All these, all these different parts all function together as a contextual data ecosystem. And that enables different systems and data sets to work together. And when we work together to enrich and, we, and when we participate in the ecosystem, it increases the value and usability of everyone's data. Okay, so uh, I'd like to just quickly thank all the members of my lab that's led by uh, Dr. Will Shao at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health at Simon Fraser University. I'd like to thank all of our partners and funders. And of course, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, if you'd like any more information about any of the standards or tools that I've mentioned, uh, many of them can be found on our GitHub site. Uh, I'm always happy to chat about these things. So if you'd like to get in touch, my contact information is uh, in the slide there. Um, that about wraps things up. Um, so thanks again for listening, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Wow, Emma, that was awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> you made me realize something uh, that... Okay, the, we in the audience, we are metadata practitioners, uh, metadata enthusiasts, uh, so we're fairly educated about metadata slash contextual uh, data. Um, but it, your presentation and David Ains' presentation on Monday, Metadata Can Kill, made me realize how important it is to make metadata known to the general public. Um, we need metadata literacy, literally. So maybe this is my project for the future. Yeah. Um, and that may contribute to, uh, to uh, standardization, better funding, or uh, just better use of 
information in general, what we share, what we don't share, and etc. So uh, that was uh, I. That, your presentation was an eye-opening presentation as well, and I didn't know how much metadata was important in the research work, especially in, in the situation of emergency. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, welcome our um, our second speaker, uh, John Roberts. Uh, John uh, again will present on uh, the data metadata enabled government. And uh, please send your questions as they come using the chat function. And uh, we'll take the questions after John's presentation. John, over to you. Uh, thank you, Marie Claude, uh, and thank you to the DCMI for the invitation to uh, present at the uh, virtual conference this year. So I will just share my screen and uh, the. Yeah, I see can, it. You see, see it there. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, so I would also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land uh, where I'm joining from. Uh, I'm here in Toronto, uh, which has been a traditional meeting place of Indigenous peoples for many thousands of years. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge particularly the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, whose relationships and stewardship were governed by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum uh, as, a, as a traditional uh, uh, governance and stewardship arrangement here in Toronto. Emma's presentation has touched on a lot of things that will, will also come up in, uh, in my talk this morning. And uh, where, where Emma's gone very deep into a particular domain and a particular uh, set of uh, initiatives and demonstrated the value of, of metadata uh, in the genomics and food science area, uh, I'm going to take a, a far more sort of broad and shallow approach and look right across uh, government, well, across a single government, Ontario, the, uh, the provincial government of uh, Ontario here in Canada, uh, and have a look at how some of those issues that uh, Emma has touched on uh, around uh, the fundamental importance of metadata or, or contextual data uh, really underpin the aspirations of government to be data enabled. Uh, the title of this slide is, is very deliberately constructed because when you look at government strategies, what we'll see is that they, they frequently talk about data and the power of data, um, but you don't need to scratch the surface very much to find that the, uh, the aspirations are deeply reliant on what we know as, as metadata. Um, so I had a, an alternative title with a, a reference to the, uh, to the old song, I was thinking of calling this, where have all the metadata gone? Uh, long time passing, uh, because they are invisible in many ways, but lurking just uh, below the surface. Before I get into the slides, just one apology. Uh, I don't have the, the funky graphics and so on that, uh, that Emma has. You will not find a, uh, a beer ontology with pictures here. You won't find uh, cool pictures of, uh, of COVID-19 viruses and, and the like. Uh, this, is, uh, this is unfortunately, or uh, uh, for whatever reason, this is very old school text heavy. So as I said, uh, when you look at government strategies, there is a, a lot of emphasis on data, but my core message to this community is that metadata still matters, still is fundamental. Uh, when I think back to some of my early days in uh, government information strategy, metadata was, was pretty visible. It was kind of often represented as a, one of the core pillars uh, that was going to be, be fundamental. In this presentation, I hope to show you that metadata is still just as fundamental. Uh, it's just less visible. And there's a few reasons uh, for that. Uh, um, the one take on it, you know, uh, one man's metadata is another man's data. And uh, uh, Emma talked to this around the, the way in which many in her community uh, prefer to talk about contextual data, uh, the, to avoid that differentiation between the, the genome content data uh, and, the, uh, and the metadata being relegated to a second uh, space. But metadata is still data. 
when we talk about data strategies, we actually need to know about whatever the core data is, whether it's a content of documents, whether it's genome sequencing, whether it's personal health information, we need to know about that data in order to manage it, in order to get any kind of public value out of it. So fundamentally, data management is metadata management. Therefore, while metadata is, is less explicitly visible as a term in government strategies, uh, I would argue it's more necessary than, than ever before to meet the kind of aspirations that are there and to, to realize the opportunities around data enabled government. The sort of things that, uh, that it underpins are the importance of transparency, transparency of government activity, government information stewardship, um, in order to, to help people engage and have trust and confidence uh, in their public institutions. It's about privacy and again, not surprising that uh, uh, Emma touched on this, privacy uh, in a, an age of big tech and fear about surveillance is, uh, is very strong. And it was great to see that uh, the program this year had a, had a whole panel on privacy and metadata earlier in the week. But good privacy protection uh, does rely deeply on, uh, on metadata. The power of, of integration of data to get more broad-based decision-making, more better public policy decisions in the end. Uh, uh, Emma, I think, referred to this as some of the, the harmonization challenges of, of data from different sources. Again, fundamentally important on what, what we as practitioners think of as, as metadata. And of course, protection uh, of, uh, of information assets. Uh, um, again, alongside privacy, cybersecurity is a, a key concern, and rightfully so, uh, of the public. You'll see in uh, some of my later slides how cybersecurity and protective practices also are deeply, deeply reliant on metadata about both the, the information assets, the data sets, and the context in which they operate. So across the board, as, uh, uh, again, as Marie-Claude said by way of introduction, I wear a number of hats uh, in the Ontario government. And from looking at those various different perspectives, whether it's as chief privacy officer, as uh, acting chief information security officer, as a member of the uh, IT executive leadership council, uh, as the, the archivist of Ontario, in all of those domains, I continue to see the fundamental importance of, uh, of metadata to, to drive a coherent data enabled approach to government. Now, the government of Ontario does have uh, a long history of, of metadata practice and indeed of, of Dublin Core. Uh, I recall uh, attending a conference probably full 15 years ago now, uh, where I was talking about New Zealand's somewhat aspirational metadata use, and was deeply envious of the, the level of uh, commitment that the Ontario government had shown to, to Dublin Core at that time, embedding DC uh, and its uh, term sets into uh, enterprise architecture framework, the snappily titled Go ITS Standards, GO, Government of Ontario, IT uh, Systems. And particularly two of those uh, standards are uh, effectively uh, just local application profiles of, of uh, DCMI, our uh, uh, Ontario web metadata element set, the Go MIS, uh, and the core metadata element uh, uh, standard, the CMES. Uh, explicitly uh, referenced uh, and just uh, Ontario skinned versions of, uh, uh, of the DCMI metadata terms. But unfortunately, when you look a little bit more closely, uh, those documents were, were uh, approved in 2005, last reviewed, and, and haven't really been updated since. And similarly, some of the, many of the other standards in our enterprise architecture framework uh, are Go its 72 geospatial metadata standard, again, drawing on uh, the uh, ISO 19115 and various other core enterprise architecture documents uh, based on standards, but haven't necessarily been modernized. So what has been happening then in the last uh, 16 years? Well, like most jurisdictions, Ontario has, uh, has been on the trajectory uh, that is familiar to, to folk from around the world, the evolution from uh, an old style e-government to more contemporary digital government. And in a digital government sense, uh, I think most of you will know, that tends to focus on digital practices, 
uh, and on data. And in terms of what that really looks like online, uh, in its classic form, it's that trajectory from downloadable forms to online forms and web forms, to then re-engineering the processes uh, in which those forms participate to actually be more data-centric, data-enabled. Uh, of course, that work itself uh, leads to a lot of the, the considerations that Emma was talking about uh, in her presentation of just how that data works to add up to a, a coherent management system. In terms of the structures supporting uh, this, this trajectory, uh, a digital service was formed in 2016 and a chief digital officer uh, established shortly after. Interestingly, that chief digital officer is now the chief digital and data officer. Again, reflecting this uh, recognition of how uh, important data is uh, for, for modern government. 2018, we had a, a major review of public service practice uh, for managing transformation, a modernization plan. A key theme in that was around modernizing services through better use of digital and shared service models. And of course, you can't share service models uh, unless you can also share data, and you can't share data if it's, if it's not going to have a, a consistent way of understanding it, if that contextual frame, uh, again, that Emma talked about, uh, is not shared and understood. So the recommendations in that, uh, in that 2018 action plan really focused on better collective use of data rather than just data as a byproduct of, of individual programs, uh, trying to use it in collective, uh, more uh, progressive, more value adding ways. So getting the, uh, the true insights uh, and uh, decision-making supports out of data at all of government scale. But it also focused on gaps about the data, information gaps. In uh, forming that action plan, the, uh, the, the team that led it uh, a number of times uh, commented on the difficulty of understanding data, of finding data, uh, of being able to, to combine it. It was difficult to understand what the data actually meant that was available. And of course, Anyone in our community would say those are metadata gaps. Those are opportunities for again, a more consistent approach to, uh, to context descriptive data, to, to metadata, to enable the data to really inform kind of system level prioritization and insights uh, that that report was, uh, was striving for. Moving forwards uh, another few years from 2018, uh, just within the last 12 months, the government has issued a major strategy called Building a Digital Ontario, and uh, the web address is there. This, in its formative time, this was uh, known colloquially as the, the Digital and Data Strategy. And uh, it's a, a fairly expensive document that really does attempt to paint a picture of how Ontario as a government uh, is going to become more digital and data centric in its work. Interestingly, it's a relatively short document uh, and it, it still manages to pack in a, 150 references to data, but without a single reference to metadata. Again, uh, quite a different kind of, uh, kind of beast than one would have found uh, in, in previous generations of, of government strategies where metadata was far more explicit and visible. But uh, Despite the fact that you could pull this down, do a, a search for metadata and, and see you know, zero mentions, uh, I would argue that in any strategy of the sort, in any data-based uh, strategy, metadata and good management of that context, quality, interoperability uh, structures of the data is absolutely inherent. I say it was a fairly short uh, document uh, in the world of government policy. Of course, we have a huge hierarchy of, uh, uh, of different instruments. And in parallel with this uh, digital and data strategy, there was a refresh of our directives that provide the next level of granularity. And we'll talk a little bit about how some of those get closer to direct mentions of, uh, of metadata uh, in the coming slides. But just to give you a sense of what that uh, uh, strategy document was, uh, was really aiming for, its vision, uh, classic government uh, vision, to be the world's leading digital jurisdiction, 
Uh, and what that means in our context uh, is very much around the people of Ontario uh, having uh, a number of uh, abilities, that they're equipped to succeed with skills and access to participate in a digital world, that privacy is protective, protected and online activity is safe, so safety and security. These two around the privacy protection, uh, cyber security uh, and online safety are areas where metadata really comes into its own. I'll talk about that again you know, shortly. Connectivity uh, around access to the data required to make decisions. So a digital strategy that is not just about government itself having access to, to data and being able to operate efficiently internally, uh, but recognizing a, a data ecosystem right across the province uh, and the value of data to everyone uh, to make decisions about business, life, health, education. So anytime uh, we start talking about better access to, to data, again, my mind, and I suspect many of your minds, uh, immediately goes to uh, the importance of that contextual data, of that metadata uh, to support that kind of functionality. And that's similar to the, to the fourth pillar of the strategy uh, around convenient, reliable and accessible government services. And here, the data design, the, the, the knowledge visibility, uh, interoperability, standardization of the data is partly around being able to find the services, but also the way in which the services themselves are defined, not just as silos, but as in, in ways that interact to create wraparound interactions. So a document that uh, sets a, a stake in the road for, uh, uh, for Ontario, for the Ontario government, emphasizes the importance of data in doing that and hints at, uh, implies perhaps uh, the importance of metadata uh, in doing so as well. That's a, a publicly facing strategy. Internally, uh, those old, uh, go at standards uh, and the like uh, are being revisited in the context of uh, an enterprise IT strategy, technology roadmap and investment plan. No point having a roadmap if you don't also have some thinking about how the, the investment will be will deliver on that. Uh, that's driven by a, a new enterprise technology strategy division and chief technology officer. You'll see that word enterprise, collective, uh, joined up, uh, coming through many times. I think that's part of the, the area in which metadata really drives, you know, metadata standardization uh, more clearly, really drives the, the implementation of these approaches. It's being able to take that shared common view of the data assets uh, and understand how they can work together rather than just work in isolation. So our technology roadmap, uh, again, really identified the importance of an enterprise and all of government view of data as a, as a key driver. And we love our jargon in government. Uh, these drivers were, were badged as modernization accelerators. But, uh, a bit trite, but uh, you can see what it means. You know, we can't become modern, contemporary in the approach to public management in a rapid way uh, if we are not taking a collective view of how data is managed, shared, used, connected. So this too is, a, is the, uh, some of the internal planning and, and machinery to make the public sector more digital and data driven and put data at the center of government decision-making to get away from people who have a, an intuition and really enable us to tackle complex public policy programs uh, with data that brings multiple perspectives. So it's focused on an enterprise approach to infrastructure. Uh, and again, some of those tools, platforms, the, uh, the ways in which data actually can technically be, be shared, linked, combined, uh, the sort of tools and infrastructure that again, Emma was talking about in her specific um, uh, practice domain will be fundamental to enabling data to deliver value at scale and across multiple ministries. And having that plumbing in place, having the right tools available uh, needs to be complemented by an enterprise approach to governance, to, to understanding uh, 
what the rules of the road are, what the standards, what the um, expectations and controls around uh, data collection, uh, access, um, quality assurance, all of the kind of uh, decision-making stewardship machinery uh, that goes along with the technical infrastructure. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, yeah, this, uh, this governance approach at scale uh, involves also refreshing the standards and making sure that we have up-to-date um, requirements across all aspects of uh, enterprise architecture to be articulating those approaches in a consistent, agreed way. The directives that uh, start to tease out in, in more detail uh, have, have a number. Historically, back in the 10 years back, we had just an information technology directive. Now we have three. Information technology directive has been modernized, uh, but complemented by two more. One of those is a, an information and data assets directive. And this one is, uh, is interesting because for, for our world, in describing the kind of assets that need to be in scope and need to be managed, there's an explicit recognition that metadata is uh, some of that uh, at core asset base of government. So the framing, the scoping of this directive deliberately attempts to go beyond just looking at data sets and documents and think about the broader um, infrastructure and context within which uh, they operate uh, and does in its list of the, the scoping concepts uh, explicitly talk of metadata as one of the kinds of assets to be, to be managed. But then it, uh, it really is about principles for managing those, those information and data assets of, of quite broad sense. And this is where we start to get into a little bit more, more precision around uh, what government thinks good data management looks like. It's about discoverability, the, uh, that the data can be found. It's about reusability, that it can be used in different contexts over time, that it's interoperable, that it can be connected and, and used meaningfully uh, and uh, linked with other, other assets in other parts of the public uh, sector. That it's protection, that it is cyber safe and is, uh, uh, is going to be uh, well managed to, to maintain its integrity uh, and that it's trustworthy, that it is um, quality information. It's authority, that it, uh, when government says, here are facts, here is some uh, reliable information, that it has that, uh, that status and its persistence over time. To do all of those, uh, probably implied, but uh, called out explicitly in this, uh, this directive as a principle, uh, is that it is contextualized. The data information needs to be linked to the, the context of its use in order to then be able to uh, be used over time, to be able to, to interoperate, to be able to be reused, to enhance the precision uh, of discoverability. Uh, and of course, uh, the flip side of the persistence is uh, appropriate disposition. Uh, it, this links back to some of the, the points that Emma made about uh, understanding when both data and the contextual uh, data actually becomes a matter of record. It is relied on for, for decision making and um, needs to be tracked in order to be accountable. And that accountability is a, a really critical dimension for, for government. Uh, hence the, uh, the prominence of disposition uh, as, uh, as a principle. I think it's important as a public management principle, not just because uh, it was some of my people from the archives of Ontario uh, who were drafting the directive. A third leg of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the stool, as it were, along with the IT directive and the information and data assets directive uh, is a digital and data direct. This builds on earlier work uh, in the classic sort of open data, open government space, uh, but also uh, now involves some of the expectations around digital practices. Uh, so the, the user uh, focus and involvement of, uh, of users in design uh, and development of government services and uh, data systems, for example, the, uh, the innovation and agility uh, approaches. 
but uh, drawing on its uh, on its open data roots, some of the statements that uh, you see there that are of particular relevance to to our community. Um, for example, the, the requirement that all data assets, uh, data assets in this context, again, is broader than just core data sets. It does start to, uh, to engage with, uh, with metadata schemes, with uh, interpretive algorithms and the like. So but the data assets need to be listed uh, in a government-wide inventory, whether or not they're, uh, they're open to the public. Um, and you'll see there you know, with sufficient metadata for broad understanding. So a recognition that the aspirations around data go far beyond just open data for the public uh, into the data management space uh, and that data management needs um, adequate and intentional metadata uh, to ensure that those assets can be, uh, can be used by everyone who has an interest in them. It also continues to uh, uh, to reference the uh, International Open Data Charter. And again, that uh, uh, does, as many folk will know, uh, have some, some fairly strong obligations around the, uh, the description and the, the metadata required to enable uh, its meaningful use uh, in an open data context. So this directive uh, makes it really clear that, uh, that open data, open government, is not just about having a set of uh, bunch of data sets that people, the public, uh, are allowed to use, or even that are available online. It's far more than just the data. And accordingly, the data catalog, this uh, government-wide data inventory, is far more than just a, a list of data sets. It is a need to document them to provide the rich context that enables the discovery, use, interpretation, uh, and that over time. Another piece that uh, I thought I should uh, throw into the mix here, again, because it's fundamentally about uh, uh, the importance of metadata, is the complementary API framework and guidelines. The uh, uh, expectation in a policy sense that data sets and solutions are designed not just as standalone pieces, even if there is a, uh, a description in our data catalog, um, but to, uh, to a very large extent should be designed uh, with appropriate APIs uh, and, and appropriate metadata, recognizing, as the guidelines say, that consistent metadata and encoding ensure those APIs are really driving value, that they are uh, interoperable uh, and creating uh, a structured data response that, that clients can use. So usability, value, uh, and interoperability. So digital and data directives, again, complementing the information and data and the, the IT. Looking a little bit further at some of these, these different domains and, and uh, how that the structured important metadata and metadata governance and management systems uh, will be important. In the area of access to information, uh, I've mentioned that it's we need more than just, just a catalog. And uh, the Building of Digital Ontario strategy floats the idea of a, of a data authority because uh, it recognizes that you know, for public value for business to to get value out of uh, data it's more than just a catalog with some easy to release data sets uh, so the aspiration of better access to high value data to you know, add innovation to inform decision making to help ontarians run their lives is key but uh, what does high value data mean? How do we prioritize? Well, unless we have some kind of strong descriptive scheme for the different data assets, uh, clearly it's going to be impossible to do any kind of, of categorization uh, around value and any kind of prioritization. But a data authority also recognizes the importance of some uh, infrastructure going beyond just API guidance and API enablement of our solutions to actually having a curated, managed public data infrastructure. Um, and that, like any kind of public infrastructure, requires standardization and governance. Standardization at all levels, particularly uh, around the contextual and metadata aspects, uh, because a data authority operating at scale is inherently going to be drawing on uh, sources, data assets from multiple different um, 
business sectors from multiple different technical uh, environments, uh, but standardization at that top level uh, is uh, is already emerging in this uh, estate authority work as a, as a critical enabler uh, of the aspiration. I like to think that this, this data authority idea um, will end up being you know, open data done right, uh, recognizing that we have you know, over 20 years of uh, experience in the open data game, and it really has still fallen short of, uh, of some of the, the early, uh, early ambitions. So uh, what have we learned from that? What do we need to be doing in a structured, standardized, enabled sense uh, to really drive public value. That, uh, that is the aspiration in our, our data authority activity. Another facet uh, that when you scratch the surface uh, quickly leads to the metadata world uh, is uh, trustworthy artificial intelligence. Because the public interest is, is not just in data assets and getting hold of them, but how we are using them and how they should be used. What is, uh, what is actually going on with uh, data and information in which the public often have a, a strong interest, particularly when that's information about them as, uh, as, as citizens. So this public interest uh, in the use of data really hits its, uh, its crunchy space uh, when we get to, to artificial intelligence. And here, uh, the early policy work is, is uh, based around three principles so far, that uh, we shouldn't be using AI in secret. So the public for confidence and social license need an understanding of how, where, when, and why uh, I, AI is being used in, in government. So again, that sort of transparency space, you can see immediately that that is to, to requires some good contextual data, some good metadata about AI practices and AI um, infrastructure in order to, to represent it. Uh, but it's AI use that Ontarians can trust. So uh, appropriate guardrails and governance. Um, that, to my mind, again, uh, takes us to definitions, categorizations, practices that are standardized uh, and are very much in the space of contextual data. Um, and finally, that the AI needs to serve all Ontarians, that it should be uh, predicated on democratic principles, um, individual rights. Uh, but then also this, uh, this principle starts to speak to uh, personal privacy, uh, avoiding surveillance uh, and uh, uh, structures of discrimination. So particularly in, in areas of privacy, uh, having those uh, contextual attributes uh, that are available to ensure that folk designing or seeking to use AI uh, applications can understand the risk context uh, in which they're operating uh, and the, uh, the nature of the information uh, in ways that really highlight how these principles will apply, absolutely fundamental. So to apply these, I think we need to be asking ourselves things like what sort of new kinds of metadata are needed, either new uh, new attributes or describing different kinds of uh, uh, entities within our, our ecosystem. The most obvious screaming example here is, is making sure that we're uh, looking at how do we get the right metadata around the algorithms uh, and the, uh, the, the AI code itself, as well as the, the data on which it, it operates. How do we link training data to uh, uh, to solutions uh, in order to get some of that line of sight around potential data bias that might have been inherited. There are some new dynamics that come into play uh, and that need to be documented uh, in our metadata and uh, contextual systems in order to make these principles real. I also uh, currently hold the, the role of Chief Information Security Officer for the province. And um, cybersecurity, far more than I had realized before I took the role on, uh, is, is about using metadata. And the, the classic view of a cybersecurity person is kind of the, the, the wannabe hacker or the, the white hat hacker uh, sitting in the basement. But cybersecurity is really all about 
risk management. And risk management is about understanding uh, different kinds of assets. But at its most basic level, uh, we classify this, the sensitivity of, of different information and in systems based on uh, uh, various factors. You know, is this high risk, low risk? Is it confidential, private? Um, but there's so much more than just that sensitivity classification. To apply cybersecurity practices and policies, we need the descriptions and the categorization of a wide range of different components in our uh, in our landscape: data and technology assets, and indeed the different uh, uh, actors uh, and individuals involved. So we need to understand both the the devices, the specific laptops and uh, uh, and endpoints, the servers. We need to understand the the applications, the the, the coded uh, solutions and systems. And of course, the data that are being managed, um, because all of that risk management requires categorization. Categorization around how different factors can affect the confidentiality, the ability to keep information only to those who should have access to it, uh, to ensure the integrity of, of systems and data, that is that nothing has been changed, uh, and the continual availability. And those different facets all require, you know, uh, extensive contextual information. In more contemporary cybersecurity models, we also look at data behavior. Is the data within our system flowing, moving, acting in the way that it would be expected? Uh, and of course, to be able to do that sort of uh, analysis requires, again, a whole new set of, uh, of uh, metadata and context in order to baseline what normal behavior uh, should, uh, should look like. And that's uh, before we then start thinking about the individual actors, their privileges and rights. So cybersecurity really is a, a, a fairly sophisticated set of application of contextual information to inform risk decisions uh, across government. We don't always have that information. Uh, a recent internal audit around our patch management status, uh, interestingly highlighted not only the uh, expected findings about levels of patching and uh, the, the practices, uh, but was also very uh, informative about the importance of having the right quality of data, described as data quality by our, our audit friends. Uh, to my reading, it was very much about the metadata quality around uh, the, uh, the solutions, around our technology fleet, around our, our data assets, in order to be prioritizing uh, and ensuring that we had the appropriate protections and controls applied to each, uh, each part of the system. Privacy, uh, we've touched on a number of times, and, and uh, yeah, Emma also highlighted the, the contribution that good metadata management makes to, to privacy protection. And um, one of the key takeaways here I'd like you to remember is that metadata for privacy protection is far more than just having an access rights term and, and, uh, and applying it consistently. Because uh, a fundamental principle of privacy is around transparency, around people being able to understand what information is, is held about them uh, and ensuring that uh, the information that is collected is actually used for the purposes for which it was collected and consistent with any kind of consent. So we're immediately into that linking of multiple different kinds of uh, data attributes through purpose statements, consent statements, um, and the information itself, making sure that that is, is well maintained uh, and uh, consistently managed. It's about data provenance, understanding you where has a particular bit of personal information come from and therefore what was the purpose for which it was collected? Can it, what can it be used for? What consents or obligations um, apply to it? Um, and uh, doing all of that is far more complex in today's highly networked environment uh, than it once was. Uh, there's a number of challenges that arise. Uh, the uh, Applying those principles into a, a network algorithm-driven AI world is non-trivial. Uh, operationalizing consent in a way that doesn't generate consent fatigue uh, is non-trivial. And recognizing that some of the, the tactics around de-identification of, uh, of information, again, uh, uh, are increasingly limited because metadata can often 
reveal things about the, the data subjects that uh, enable re-identification. It can act, metadata can act as, as proxy identifiers. Uh, one thinks of the telecom world where data is traditionally the content of the call. Metadata may be things like the, the phone number, the location, etc. cetera. Uh, re-identification or even uh, proxy uh, uh, identifiers exist in that world. So that blurring boundary between uh, uh, content data and contextual data, particularly around the risks to privacy, uh, require us to take a, a comprehensive approach and not think about privacy purely in the lens of the information itself, but really the context and the management tools that enable us to provide assurances and provide transparency. Uh, I'll leave it at that on this one, because I know there was a, a whole uh, session on, uh, on Monday, and I'm sure that folk who are keen on this angle attended that session. Emma spoke about uh, uh, the challenges of, uh, of harmonizing, linking data from different sources. Uh, and uh, that's absolutely true. I, I won't uh, dwell on that. Um, but data integration also has a, a huge dimension in the, in the privacy world. Because as I said, privacy principles expect that uh, data will be used in the context for which it was collected and only very, very limited reuse. But at the same time, that is an important principle. Uh, good government uh, also uh, requires a broad range of data points to come together to inform better decision-making. Uh, in Ontario, we've tackled this through some uh, uh, privacy protective uh, approaches to integration of personal information, uh, particularly to drive better public management of so resource allocation, program and service delivery, and program evaluation. And doing so, it will come as no surprise, uh, involves extensive use of metadata, not just for the technical linking side, uh, but for that uh, social license, transparency and trust. So our, our data standards uh, that are a core component of the regime uh, make it clear that um, you have to, if you're doing this kind of work, if you're doing the, the linking, the identification and analysis, um, you need to be keeping some fairly extensive uh, metadata around the purposes, the data elements that are used, the sources the, uh, and the purposes. So again, codifying some of those dimensions of privacy practice uh, into standards uh, to ensure that linking and integration is done within a, a socially acceptable and, a, uh, and an accountable context. I was really delighted to hear uh, Emma mention the uh, the, the way in which contextual data can itself become part of a, a matter of record. Because in my, my role as leading the, the record keeping uh, practices in, uh, in the government of Ontario, again, uh, this is not just about uh, keeping things that happen to, to be created, it's about record keeping by design. And that means contextualizing and uh, ensuring adequate record keeping metadata applied intentionally. And it does that by uh, uh, really integrating record keeping requirements analysis into, uh, into IT projects. So rather than trying to apply record keeping practice to the, uh, to the results, to the outputs of a product, uh, applying the practices and analysis and criteria into the design to enable adequate context uh, to be captured and linked to, uh, to content in such a way that it can serve as, uh, as evidence. And that's far more even than just proper application of record keeping metadata in a, in a document management context. Indeed, uh, what we see is that uh, some of the most fertile ground is where uh, record keeping application of concepts enables the integration of document management technology into line of business systems with automated process uh, analysis, creating, capturing the right metadata. So record keeping doesn't become a you know, description after the fact, it becomes uh, very much an automated embedded process, but metadata at the heart of that um, broad contextualization of content uh, to enable it to, to stand. And to meet some of those trust, accountability, persistence purposes that you'll recall from 
uh, the directives and strategies that I mentioned earlier on. And finally, because I guess uh, uh, archives are traditionally seen as the end of the line for, uh, for, uh, for data and records, although I'm not sure I completely agree with that characterization, uh, we'll touch on archival description. How does this uh, evolve in a world of enhanced data management? Well, archival description uh, becomes far more about the inheritance of this rich world of metadata that we've been talking about, the, the metadata created to protect, to contextualize, to interoperate, to assure privacy. Uh, so it's a, in a sense, archival description becomes a different kind of metadata reuse rather than a kind of metadata application domain. And in that context, uh, it's about differentiating the metadata in records that has been applied automatically and, and captured in these systems, uh, but also understanding what is, is missing that enables persistence of context, persistence of meaning. Uh, so a huge implication for us to, to be doing good public management, data enabled public management well, not just at a point in time, but over in time through evolving the archival description domain. So through all of those Different, uh, different facets. Hopefully you've seen that while uh, metadata may not be sort of the headline message anymore in, uh, in government strategies, uh, the extensive uh, engagement with data and the potential data for better government uh, is absolutely a recognition of the importance of our contextual data world, of our metadata world in enabling good contemporary government. And in short, it doesn't matter if you don't see meta in the data descriptions. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Marie-Claude. Well, I thank you, John. Uh, as usual, I say as usual because I've heard you uh, speak in uh, other venues and other occasions. As usual, you are fantastic. Uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, people in the, in the audience, join me for a virtual round of applause to our, to our two speakers. We don't have that button to uh, raise the, the hand and give you a high five, but uh, here, here's the virtual high five to, uh, to both of you. That was, uh, that was a superb session, really. Uh, I've learned so much and I have so much food uh, for thought that uh, I, think, I don't think my brain can, uh, can think of, uh, about all those uh, new uh, subjects of, uh, of reflection. Thank you to you both. And also, please join me to, uh, to thank uh, Sunny Han for unwavering technical support, as well as uh, Nishad Talhat and Tom Baker. I believe that for uh, Sunny and Nishad, it's uh, middle of the night. So thank you for your, uh, <laughs> for your presence and dedicated support. And uh, a huge thank you to you all who attended the session uh, for your time, for your engagement, and you make this session um, uh, possible, this event possible. So thank you very much. And uh, please come back tomorrow, October 8th at 14 UTC. So that's 2 p.m. Universal Time for the fourth panel of the conference, which will be on metadata and gender diversity. Until then, you take care, stay safe, stay away from COVID. And uh, I wish you a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.